happy Sabbath. We pray for a blessing today. The blessing comes through the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. So you're not going to hear my voice today. You lift up your heart to the Lord and let the Lord speak to you. Shall we pray before we begin this message? Father in heaven, as we open your word, as we study solemn events before us, we pray for the blessing of your spirit. We pray that you will draw close to us now and teach us for Jesus' sake. And please forgive us of all our sins. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. What we're going to be sharing today is also available in a new publication from White Horse Media. It's both on PDF and a print version, and we will have these available for free for those who want to take them home this afternoon. It was May 31, 1973, and Indian Airlines Flight 440 was descending to land at the New Delhi Airport. On board, passenger George Larson was sitting in a back row visiting with one of the flight attendants. Without thinking much about it, George reached down and unbuckled his seat belt as they were about to land. Suddenly, George felt himself thrown from his seat as the plane slammed into the ground with a very hard impact. The plane then began skidding across the tarmac, and as it did, it started to break apart. As it broke apart, there was flashes, there were screams, as people didn't realize what was happening, and George woke up amidst the wreckage of the aircraft. He tried to move, but his legs would not respond to his brain's commands. He was stuck. Suddenly, there was an explosion as jet fuel from the broken aircraft caught fire. George knew that he had to act quickly or he would perish. So with all his strength, he pushed the debris off of him, rolled down into the ground, and began crawling away from the flames, eventually reaching a place of safety. Of the 65 passengers and crew on board, George was one of 17 who survived. It is said that in a major crisis or disaster, there is a 10-80-10 rule. 10% of the people panic. 80% of the people freeze and do nothing, like the deer in the headlight look. And 10% take action. George took action, and his life was saved. Now, is there a spiritual lesson to learn from this story? Should God's people be prepared to take action during earth's final crisis? If so, what should that action be? And how can we have such a walk with God that we do not freeze or panic when the crisis comes? The Bible tells us in Proverbs 27, verse 12, A prudent man foresees the evil and hides himself. Here the Bible commends the God-given common sense to look ahead and see what's coming and act accordingly. In our story, George knew if he didn't act, he would perish. Unfortunately, many are not prudent, and when the storm bursts around them, they are crying out, what do I do now? They panic or freeze instead of doing that which is needful. Today we want to look at some simple, concise answers about a soon-coming prophetic event, one that will bring a life-threatening storm of trouble and persecution to our world. It includes the Bible's last warning sign that foreshadows coming destruction. That sign is identified in scriptures as the abomination of desolation, Matthew 24, 15, which is synonymous with the setting up and enforcement of the mark of the beast. This study considers both the spiritual preparation and the practical action necessary for God's people when that fateful time arrives. For the past 150 years, perhaps no prophetic sign has been more pondered upon than Christ's return, and no coming indicator has been more focused focused upon than the mark of the beast. God's people have known since the middle of the 19th century in general terms that a law enforcing the mark of the beast would eventually come. Yet as this event draws near, little is said about what to expect when it arrives. This 
This presentation is specifically designed for those who are aware of the prophetic significance of a national Sunday law being enforced in the United States. Now it is clear that God has true believers in every church, yet most are unaware of the importance of the Bible Sabbath. They have not understood that the Seventh-day Sabbath was one of the richest spiritual blessings God gave to man at creation and was observed by God's people all through the Old and New Testaments. A study of history clearly points out that worship on Sunday did not originate from the teachings of the Bible, but from the traditions of man. Likewise, many have not understood how during the time of the Mark of the Beast, as earth's nations combine into a unified opposition to truth, the enforcement of Sunday will become the great divisive issue bringing the Sabbath test before God's true people everywhere. The the resulting persecution against those who refuse to worship the beast or his image or to receive his mark will lead many to study the prophecies as never before. These people will then see the beautiful truths of God's word, which they were previously unaware, and many will take their stand for Christ and his holy law despite fierce opposition and challenges. If you are watching this event and unaware of the Sunday law issue in prophecy, please refer to our White Horse Media video series, Startling Prophecies for America. History reveals that worshiping on Sunday originated with pagan sun worship, and that this substitute day slowly crept into Christianity in the early centuries. During those times, large numbers of pagans entered the church, bringing many false beliefs with them, which were eventually accepted by the church and substituted for the truths of God's word. It's interesting to note that in Catholic literature, including the Catechism, the Roman Church claims it was responsible for the change of the Bible Sabbath to Sunday, though not from any direct command found in the New Testament, but from its own authority. Catholic record, September 1, 1923, even boldly states Sunday is the, quote, mark of the Church's authority. On March 7, 321 A.D., the Roman Emperor Constantine, who had proclaimed himself a Christian, enacted the world's first Sunday law, which commanded the world to honor Sunday as the day of rest. Most recently, in his famous encyclical, Laudato Si, Pope Francis has been pushing for a return to universal Sunday observance as the global answer to climate change. Revelation 13 identifies the Roman Catholic Church as the beast power at the end of time. In Revelation 14, verse 9 through 12, the mark of the beast is identified as false worship or substitute worship in which man's traditions, Sunday, are honored in place of God's holy word and his seventh day Sabbath. Revelation 13 goes on to describe a second beast or world power that will enforce or compel the world to honor Sunday. The second beast is described as starting off with lamb-like or Christ-like qualities, but in the end, the Bible says it will speak as a dragon. The second beast is a symbol of the United States of America. In speaking of the second beast, Revelation 13, 14 says, And that deceiveth them that dwell on the earth, saying that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. Here the Bible is describing a time when false worship, the image to the beast, will be substituted for true worship. In the book Great Controversy, we read, When the leading churches of the United States, uniting upon such points of doctrine as are held by them in common, shall influence the state to enforce their decrees and to sustain their institutions, then Protestant America will have formed an image to the Roman hierarchy, and the infliction of civil penalties will inevitably result. From page 578, we read, It has been shown that the United States is the power represented by the beast with lamb-like horns, and this prophecy shall be fulfilled when the United States shall enforce Sunday observance, which Rome claims as the special acknowledgement of her supremacy. Thus, the enforcement of the mark of the beast occurs when a nationwide law honoring Sunday is passed in the United States and goes into effect. In Revelation 12, 17 and 14, 12, the Bible also states that God's people at the end of time will be known as the people who keep the commandments of God and who have the faith of Jesus. In a Vox News article from October 2018, a little over a year ago, had this headline, Why We Need Blue Laws, that's Sunday Laws, the religious tradition that sanctifies life outside of work. 
And it goes on to say the subtitle is Religious Blue Laws or Sunday Laws Achieve Many of the Same Goals as Progressive Labor Unions. If you go back and you read Spirit of Prophecy, what is talked about unions in the last days, it's very interesting. But let's look at the article. The article goes on to make the argument why America needs Sunday blue laws. It states, and I quote, Blue laws are also a way that the state enshrines a special time for citizens to exercise rights to assembly, religious and secular. Assembly requires that people have time off together, so it doesn't work to simply mandate that businesses close for any random 24-hour period of time because that doesn't ensure everybody has time off together. The rationale is Americans have a right to religious worship together. They cannot exercise this right if businesses are allowed to close any time they want. All must be closed at the same time so people can assemble together for worship. And that same time is Sunday. Using this rationale, we, real, we see how it is not difficult for many to be convinced and support a national Sunday law. They will say our nation is divided, Politics is polarized, morality is tanked, and the weather is crazy. We need to set aside time for people to return to God and be able to worship together, and that will involve everyone having the same day off to worship, along with time for their family. In addition, it will be said that requiring this national day of rest will improve the environmental health of the planet, reduce pollution, and save energy. Many will be convinced by these arguments, even though Sunday is not the day of rest commanded in the Word of God. Eventually, all will be compelled to rest on a substitute day enforced by law and based on man's traditions and papal power. The significance of the passing of the National Sunday Law is the warning shot to the world that the time of the mark of the beast has begun. Prophecy tells us that at the time of this legislation, the world will be descending into a time of confusion and chaos. When good is referred to as bad and bad is referred to as good, are you seeing that already today? At the same time, an overwhelming sense of one's final standing before God will come upon his people as they realize the end has finally come. In the crisis, where will they turn? The Bible says in Proverbs 18.10, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. This is where the righteous in that evil time will find safety. So with that introduction, let's look now at the ten most important things to know when the National Sunday Law arrives. Number one, ensure you have a living connection with Christ. After the passing of the federal Sunday legislation in the United States, the world will have entered the early time of trouble. During this perilous time, the judgment of the living and or the sealing will be going on in heaven, as brought out in Ezekiel chapter 9 and Revelation chapter 7. Human probation is about to close as God's people are being sealed into salvation and the wicked are receiving the beast's mark. During this time, it is vital to have a living connection with Christ. Revelation 3, 5 says, He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Many who profess to be God's people, yet who choose to wait until the last minute to get ready, will suddenly find themselves unprepared for the test and be lost. This is not some arbitrary decision by God to keep them out, but when the crisis comes, their lack of faith simply cannot grasp the promises of God and hold on. In short, they do not have a living connection with Christ, one that reflects a developed trust. Thus, one thing is needful, which is to know Christ now. And whether you are listening to this before the crisis hits or during the crisis, realize that a living connection with the Savior is our only hope. Thus, you must learn to exercise faith in Him. Now, to clarify, probation does not close at the initial passing of the Sunday law, not even for those in the church who aren't completely ready. Though judgment does begin at the house of God, meaning that God's people will be judged or sealed first, we are also told that the Sabbath will be the great test for the people of God. Yet those who have waited until the last minute can only be saved with much soul-searching and earnest, agonizing prayer and deep repentance for their foolishness. In the end, they will be sorry they waited so long to get ready. 
In Christ and his, the book Christ and His Sanctuary, page 126, we read, Solemn are the scenes connected with the closing work of the atonement. Momentous are the interests involved therein. The judgment is now passing to the sanctuary above. For many years the work has been in progress. Soon, none know how soon, it will pass to the cases of the living. In the awful presence of God, our lives are to come up in review. At this time, above all others, it behooves every soul to heed the Savior's admonition. Watch and pray, for you know not when the time is. So if we find we don't have that living connection, how do we get it? Make a committed decision for Christ to be Lord of your life. In essence, we must give ourselves wholly and completely to Him. Someone might ask the question, what is a committed decision? What is an example of that? Picture a marriage. A young man and a young woman are getting married. What does marriage mean? It is a mutual commitment of loyalty to be true to each other with all former romantic relationships left behind. A committed decision doesn't mean one brings a former lover to live with them and their new spouse. Yet how many say to Christ, I love you with all my heart and I commit to a new life with you, but do you, mean, do you mind if I bring some of my sinful past to live with us? Christ is calling for a committed decision. We cannot have it both ways. Luke 14, says, So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath cannot be my disciple. To have that committed relationship with Christ, we must be fully his in an unreserved surrender. Now there is a vast difference between anxiety, panic, or panic over the desire for life and the soul's innermost need of a lasting change, which is being transformed into the image of Christ. Those who wholly desire to follow Christ will wish to be like Him regardless of their circumstances or the surrounding crisis. However, others only focus upon the saving of their human lives as if they could carry their sinful state of mind into the heavenly kingdom. They panic because they do not know what to do. Their focus is an external one and not a sincere desire for a change of heart and life. Thus, it is important to recognize our need for the transforming grace of Christ over a desire to continue our sinful existence and perpetuate a heart of selfish, selfish indulgence into eternity. As we recognize this, we pray and seek God with all our hearts, asking Him to make this change in us. Amen. Jeremiah 29, 13 tells us, And you shall seek me and find me when? When you search for me with all your heart. All your heart. The Bible says the just shall live by faith, Hebrews 10, 38. Thus we step forward and take God at His word, believing that what He says about forgiveness, transformation, and empower applies to us personally and refusing to let go of Him regardless of the circumstances. This is the committed decision of true faith. Number two, pray the Lord will hold the winds of strife until the third angel's work is finished. Speaking of this in the book of Revelation chapter 7 and verse 1, the servant of the Lord states, The prophets saw four angels attending, standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor the sea, nor any tree. Another angel ascending from the east cried to them, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Then she goes on to say, this points out the work we now have to do, which is to cry to God for the angels to hold the four winds until missionaries shall be sent to all parts of the world and shall have proclaimed the warning against disobeying the law of Jehovah. As God's people at the enforcement of the mark of the beast see trouble coming and many unprepared and unwarned, they plead with God for an extension of time to finish the work. There's a story in the Bible that illustrates the need to hold back time so the work of God can be completed. We find it recorded when Joshua was fighting the Lord's battle inside the promised land. You know, in Scripture, Old Testament physical battles often represent end-time spiritual ones. In Joshua chapter 10, we find this intense battle going on and God fighting for His people. During the battle, they see that if night comes, much of the work of God will be cut short and left unfinished. So by faith, Joshua cries out to the Lord in chapter 10, verse 12 and 13. And we read, Then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Ajalon. 
And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Notice how Joshua asked the Lord for more time, and God answered. By faith, Joshua commands the sun to stand still for time to essentially be extended when it otherwise wouldn't be so the work of God can be finished. Like Joshua, the people of God during the time of the Sunday law crisis realize the end has come and many are unreached and unprepared. So to finish their task, they plead with the Lord to hold back the winds of strife until the message can go to every part of the world. This indicates the work we're to be doing now and at the beginning of the time of trouble. Number three, when the Sunday law is passed, if you live in large U.S. cities, follow Christ's instruction, leave immediately, and don't wait. If you live in small cities or towns, prepare to leave, but you do not have to leave yet. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 15, When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which are in Judea flee into the mountains. Here Christ gave his followers a sign to watch for when sudden destruction was coming. The Bible defines the abomination of desolation with Luke, in Luke chapter 20, 21, verse 20 and 21, it refers to the time when Jerusalem would be surrounded by armies. Christ told his disciples that the Roman armies would come and surround the city, planting their mark or standard on the holy ground outside the walls. This should be the sign to them that destruction was coming and they were to leave. He gave this sign almost 40 years in advance, but it happened exactly as he said it would. The historian Josephus tells us that the Roman army under General Cestius came and surrounded Jerusalem in 66 AD. The Christians in the city knew this was it. This was a sign they had been watching for, but they couldn't leave because the city was surrounded. History then records that the army, the General Cestius, took his army and withdrew. And when he did, there were those in Jerusalem that we would call violent extremists. And the violent extremist Jews left Jerusalem and attacked the Roman army from the rear, causing great havoc. And while the armies of Rome were fighting with the extremists, what do you think the Christians did? They all left the city. Jesus, referring to that time, gave this admonition. Let him, when it was time to flee, well, let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return to get his clothes. But pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Now notice what we read in Spirit of Prophecy, volume 4, page 26, referring to this time. Jesus declared to the listening disciples that judgments were to fall upon apostate Israel, and especially retributive judgment would come upon them for their rejection and crucifixion of the Messiah. Unmistakable signs would precede the awful climax. The dreaded hour would come suddenly and swiftly, and the Savior warned his followers, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, then let them which are in Judea flee into the mountains." She goes on to say, when the idolatrous standards of the Romans should be set up in the holy ground, which extended some furlongs outside the city walls, then the followers of Christ were to find safety in flight. When the warning sign should be seen, judgment was to follow so quickly that those who would escape must make no delay. Now, when we look at history, often we think, well, the Jews, the Christians, when the Romans withdrew, they had plenty of time to leave. But no, that's actually not what happened. They had very little time to get out. Let's continue reading. He who chanced to be upon his housetop must not go down through his house into the street, but must speed his way from roof to roof until he reached the city wall and be saved so as by fire. Those who are working in the fields or vineyards must not take time to return for their outer garments laid aside while they should toil in the heat of the day. They must not hesitate for a moment lest they be involved in the general destruction." This is where their faith was tested. Did they believe Christ's words? If so, they were to flee, trusting everything to Him. Now, would God's people be willing to do the same thing today? When God's people sees the sign come to pass that Christ has warned us about, just like in the disciples, will we follow by faith the same instructions? Thus, while the armies of Rome were fighting outside with the Jewish extremists, 
the Christians left and made their escape with no one to oppose them. Later, the Roman army returned under the leadership of General Titus, and this time they stayed until the city was destroyed. But history records not a single Christian died in the siege of the city because they had followed Christ's warnings and left. Now, Matthew 24 is a, recognized as a dual application chapter. This means the same prophetic words hold an application in the days of the disciples as well as in the last days. As there was an ancient mark of pagan Rome placed on the holy ground in Jerusalem's day, so near the end of time there will be a mark of modern or papal Rome placed on the holy ground during our day, and we've already seen what that mark is. So, what is holy ground? In the days of the disciples, Jerusalem, or holy ground, was the initial place from which the gospel went to the entire world of their day. What country would represent that today? What country has been responsible for sending the gospel to the world in today's society? When the mark of papal Rome comes upon holy ground, that is that nation that has been foremost in spreading the gospel to the world, the United States of America, then know it is the sign that destruction is imminent and the time has come to leave the large cities. In the book Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, we read, The time is not far distant when, like the early disciples, we shall be forced to seek a refuge in desolate and solitary places. As the siege of Jerusalem by the Roman armies was a signal for flight to the Judean Christians, so the assumption of power on the part of our nation in the decree enforcing the papal Sabbath will be a warning to us. It will then be time to leave the large cities preparatory to leaving the smaller ones for retired homes and secluded places among the mountains. If you live in the large cities... Are you willing to follow Christ's instruction, though many will laugh at you and mock you? Like Lot, are you willing to trust everything and leave with the clothes on your back if necessary? This will be a test of the faith of God's people at that time. Are they willing to go out by faith? If you live in the country, as many of you here do, are you willing to open your hearts and your homes to those fleeing and needing a place to go? Like the early disciples, are you willing to live with others and have all things in common? As God opens the way, it is clearly better to leave the cities sooner, continuing our outreach to them as Enoch did from the base of a country home. Many in God's Many in God's church today also do not realize that prophecy points to two occasions to flee at the end of time. The first takes place at the enactment of the National Sunday Law in the United States, which is a warning to those in the large cities to leave immediately, for judgment is about to begin. You know, we're told in prophecy a time will come when those who want to leave the cities won't be able to. In fact, if you're watching today the news these days, you can see that actually happening in some parts of the world. The time of fleeing at the National Sunday Law is the relocation of one's home out of the large cities into the rural areas or small towns. In some cases, people may have to stay, stay with friends or family. This is the type of fleeing we have discussed. However, there is a second type and that takes place at the end of the loud cry as God's people have been giving the message with great power. The wicked turn on them and they have to flee into the mountains and the distant recesses to escape. Be careful not to mix up the two occasions of flight. In 1905, Ellen White had a dream of fleeing in the time of trouble. She says in manuscript 153, 1905, During the night a very impressive scene passed before me. There seemed to be great confusion and the conflict of armies. A messenger from the Lord stood before me and said, Call your household, I will lead you, follow me. He led me down a dark passage, through a forest, then through the clefts of the mountains. And he said, Here you are safe. There were others who had been led to this retreat. The heavenly messenger said, The time of trouble has come as a thief in the night, as the Lord warned you it would come. At the time of the Sunday law, God's people will clearly know when it is time to flee. But at the end of the work of the latter rain, they will not. It will come upon them suddenly and unexpectedly, and they will have to turn and go to the mountains. Notice that at the time in her dream, the time to flee to the mountains also comes at a time when there was a conflict of armies. Did you catch that in her dream? There was a conflict of armies, and the angel says it is time to flee. 
In the disciples' day, was there a conflict of armies when the Christians had to flee? Yes. Just like it was then, so it will be at the end. Who was fighting in the disciples' day? The armies of the world's only superpower were battling with the extremists, the violent extremists. Hmm. Who are the armies of the world's only superpower battling with today? Number four, realize that God's destructive judgments are about to be poured out. The Bible says in Joel 2, 29 and 30, And in those days will I pour out my spirit, referring to the time of the latter rain, and I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The latter rain comes during the time of the outpouring of God's judgments, still mixed with mercy while probation is open. These judgments are designed to awaken people, and many will turn to the Lord as a result. Yet the wicked will look upon these judgments as coming because Sunday is not more strictly enforced. Notice this quote. Men in responsible positions will not only ignore and despise the Sabbath themselves, but from the sacred desk will urge upon the people the observance of the first day of the week. They will point to calamities on land and sea, to the storms of wind, floods, earthquakes, destruction by fire, as judgments indicating God's displeasure because Sunday is not sacredly observed. These calamities will increase more and more, one disaster following close upon the heels of another. And those who make void the law of God will point to the few who are keeping the Sabbath of the fourth commandment as the ones who are bringing wrath upon the world. Number five, take your Bibles and other literature and go visit those closest to you, warning them what is coming. We are told we are to be doing this at the time when the mark of the beast is being enforced. Ellen White was once asked what she would do in the event of Sunday enforcement, and here's what she said. And they asked us, what will you do now when, Sunday, when the Sunday law is carried into execution? Said I, I have got that all mapped out in my mind, what I will do, and what I will advise you to do. Go right out from house to house and carry publications that will teach them how to obtain eternal life. Here, Sister White says we should make Sunday a missionary day. In the late 19th century, there were those who misunderstood what they should do and thought by disobeying local Sunday closing laws and openly defying them by working in the presence of their neighbors, they were pleasing God. But Mrs. White corrected them on this. She went on to say, to defy the Sunday laws will but strengthen their persecution. The religious zealots who are seeking to enforce them Give them no occasion to call you lawbreakers. One does not receive the mark of the beast because he shows that he realizes the wisdom of keeping the peace by refraining from work that gives offense. Therefore, it is not wrong to make Sunday a missionary day. This is a more balanced and beneficial approach because the real focus is on saving souls. When the final Sunday laws hit, we should use Sunday as a missionary day for outreach, realizing that every spare minute should be given to warn those who have no understanding of these last day prophecies. Manuscript 64, 1910, we are told, Now I want to say that night after night there is presented before me that all at once affliction and sorrow and distress will be brought upon our people. They, Satan and his angels, are preparing for it. Then what are we to do? We're to do the very best we can to enlighten the world while we can do it. If the devil and his angels are preparing for it, so should we. We need to be doing our work by reaching our friends and neighbors for Christ. Number six, be prepared for hardship, persecution, and imprisonment. In a society known for the rights of its individual citizens, the thought of suffering innocently does not bode well. Yet of this unjust time, the words of Jesus ring true. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Referring to this time of trouble, the servant of the Lord tells us in the book Last Day Events, many will be imprisoned, many will flee for their lives from cities and towns, and many will be martyrs for Christ's sake in standing in defense for the truth. During such a time, God's people must not yield to the temptation to fight back, for it is not the Spirit of Christ. When our funds are suddenly cut off or our travels are restricted without cause, we are to maintain the peace of Christ and act just like He did before His accusers. One does, how does one prepare for persecution? Pray for Christ to change us and give us the patient endurance as seen in the life of Jesus. Plead with Him to mold us and shape us to be calm in every difficult situation. This type of preparation only comes as God does the work in us, and now is the time we should be asking for that preparation. 
We are also counseled that during the time of trouble, God's people will be scattered going from place to place, from areas of intense persecution to where it is not so severe. This means we must be listening to that still small voice as the Lord guides us where to go. We're told the manuscript releases volume 5, the time is soon coming when God's people because of persecution will be scattered in many countries. Those who have received an all-around education will have the advantage where they are. Number seven, realize the latter rain is needed and be praying for it. The Bible tells us in Habakkuk 2 verse 14, For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Quoting the same verse, the servant of the Lord states, At this time, while there is so much war and famine and pestilence, while there are calamities by land and by sea, the truth is to be made known. The latter rain comes in its fullness during earth's early time of trouble. However, it doesn't come until God's church is shaken and the people earnestly pray for the latter rain. In 1 Kings chapter 18, Elijah prayed for rain after the test between true and false worship. He prayed seven times and the rain came. Likewise, during the coming time of trouble, God's people are to look forward to the latter rain as the refreshing that will come to enable them to finish the work. Thus, they must be earnestly praying and pleading with the Lord for the Spirit for the latter rain to be poured out. We're told in the time of confusion and trouble, such as never was since there was a nation. That sounds pretty bad, doesn't it? That's the early time of trouble. That's not even the seven last plagues. But she says the uplifted Savior will be presented to the people in all lands and in all places that all who look may live. Number eight, be prepared to be a medical missionary. In the book Last Day Events, page 80, we read, I wish to tell you that soon there will be no work done in ministerial, ministerial lines but medical missionary work. After the enactment of the National Sunday Law, wars, disasters, and pestilence will increase as America compels the world to follow its lead. During the same time, the message of God's people will be mischaracterized as a message of hate, extremism, and violence. This will be due in part to those who say they are part of God's remnant, but who are actually the foolish virgins and without the Holy Spirit. These unbalanced individuals will resort to extreme and violent measures which the devil will use to taint the opinions of society against God's people. Thus, between the Sunday law and the latter reign, as society further restricts the work of God's people, they will find the only way to minister to others will be through medical missionary work. As they do, doors will open to reach hearts. What constitute medical missionary work? Too often we have passed it off as cold, rigid lectures when that's not the case. Real medical missionary work starts with adopting the spirit of Christ in considering the needs of others over our own. It's something we can practice in our own lives, in our own neighborhoods, with our own neighbors. As God's people selflessly meet others' needs with loving care, many hearts are open to listen to God's truth. The story is told of a chaplain during America's Civil War, was passing over the battlefield, and he saw a soldier lying there, and he said to the soldier, would you like me to read something out of my Bible for you? And the soldier instead says, sir, I'm so thirsty, I wish I had a drink of water. So the chaplain left and returned with some water and gave the wounded soldier a drink. And then the soldier said, if I only had something under my head, as he's lying there wounded. So the chaplain took off his, one of his garments and he rolled it into a, a pillow and he put it under the man's head. <clears throat> and then the man says, I'm so cold lying here. So the chaplain took his big heavy overcoat and covered the man up like a blanket. And then the man said to him, now tell me if there's anything in that book that makes a man do for me what you just did, I want to hear it. This is the spirit of true medical missionary work. Meeting the needs of people where they are at. It is when we are found working selflessly for the betterment of others that they will be attracted to what we have to say. Yeah. Number nine, pray for wisdom to dispose quickly what you don't need. Unfortunately, the Bible tells us that the end will come suddenly upon those who have hoarded their treasures rather than sacrificing for the cause of God. Let's read from the book's Councils on Stewardship. Houses and lands will be of no use to the saints in the time of trouble, for they will then have to flee before infuriated mobs, and at that time their possessions cannot be disposed of to advance the cause of present truth. I was shown that it is the will of God that the saints should cut loose of every encumbrance before the time of trouble comes and make a covenant with God through sacrifice. If they have their property on the altar and earnestly inquire of God for duty, He will teach them when to dispose of these things. Then they will be free in the time of trouble and have no clogs to weigh them down. 
Unfortunately, some will not ask of the Lord. And when the time comes, they lose everything that could have been used in God's work. From Review and Herald, 1878, we read this. Hoarded wealth will soon be worthless. What is it? Hoarded wealth. The money we've saved and saved and saved and saved will soon be worthless. When the decree shall go forth that none shall buy or sell, except they that have the mark of the beast, very much means will be of no avail. Ooh. That means a lot of our means collectively will no longer be available for use. So shouldn't we be asking the Lord, Lord, Whatever I have, here it is. Use it up before the time comes because when we come down to the end, the goal is to have zero left. If you have anything left over, it's wasted. God calls for us now, she says, to do all in our power to send forth the warning to the world. One area in which funds can rapidly be used up is the publishing work. Consider this quote. As long as probation lasts, there will be the opportunity for the canvasser, or the colporter, we could say, to work. When the religious denominations unite with the papacy to oppress God's people, places where there is religious freedom will be opened up by evangelistic canvassing. If in one place the persecution becomes severe, let the workers do as Christ directed. When they persecute you in this city, flee into another. If they persecute you, if the persecution comes there, go still to another place. God will lead his people, making them a blessing in many places. Thus we are told the canvassing work will continue to the very end. God's people will be taking their books and materials out from house to house trying to reach the people. Thus purchasing materials of heaven-sent truth is one example of an excellent way to use up your money at the end of time because you're investing in products that you're going to give to people to bring them eternal life. Number 10, realize that a great shaking is coming along with spiritual darkness. And this will surround God's people. Therefore, pray for your brothers and sisters and for a faith to withstand the trial. Between the time of the passing of the National Sunday Law and the latter reign, God's church will experience a terrible shaking. As the prophecy of Joel Joel points out, the people of God will be sighing and crying during this time. We read in Joel 2.17, Let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach. So often we in the church lament the sins of others. But how often are we praying for those in the church? And not simply a 10-second prayer filled with generalities, but a deep, earnest, agonizing prayer for the soul salvation of others. How often do we pray for others as Jesus prayed for them? In addition to praying for others, we will also have to wrestle for our own tempted and tried souls. In Gethsemane, Christ was surrounded by darkness that Satan threw around him, trying to convince him to give up. It's hopeless, we can hear the devil say. If you go through with this, you will never come out of the tomb. In the same way, he will bring a similar attack upon God's people in the final crisis. We are told in the book, Councils for the Church, He, speaking of Satan, endeavors to affright the soul with the thought their case is hopeless, that the stain of their defilement will never be washed away. He hopes so destroy their faith that they will yield to his temptations, turn from from God, and receive the mark of the beast. Now, it's interesting is that this quote, when this happens, this is before the latter reign. Satan is trying to preempt the latter reign to discourage God's people to say, give up, you just can't make it, you're not going to be saved. Because he knows at the time of the latter reign, when the refreshing comes, they will go out with great power to bring in large multitudes. Thus he tries to get them with a vice grip, give up, give up. This is where the faith of God's people shines through. Because they hold on to Christ anyway. They're the ones who receive the refreshing and go out and finish the work. In Psalms chapter 4, verse 5, it says, Offer sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. During the early time of trouble, the shaking of the church and the latter rain, God's people will be offering to Him sacrifices of righteousness. It's not me, it's Christ. This means they will be brought face to face with their own sinful hearts and will willingly choose to turn away from self whatever the consequences or what it requires them to give up. Thus they allow Christ to burn the dross from them as silver and gold is refined. The righteous are then brought to fully understand what it means to trust in Jesus. 
The servant of the Lord said, she said in manuscript 5, the angel said, some tried too hard to believe. Hmm. Think about that. Some, God's people, tried too hard to believe. The angel said, faith is so simple, you look above it. Sometimes we make faith harder than what it really is. And this is the angel speaking to the servant of the Lord saying, you make faith. You make faith too hard. It's so simple. You look above it. Satan has deceived some and got them looking at their own unworthiness. I saw they must look away from self to the worthiness of Jesus and throw themselves just as they are, needy and dependent upon and unworthy upon his mercy and draw by faith strength and nourishment from him. Isn't this the story of our lives? We make faith too hard by constantly looking at ourselves. It is looking away from ourselves and by believing and trusting Jesus, even in impossible situations, that victory comes. What then is the hope of God's people at the end? If they, like the thief on the cross, who suddenly found himself facing death and unprepared to die, what should God's people do when the mark of the beast comes? Isaiah 27, 5 says, Let him take hold of my strength that he may make peace with me, and he shall make peace with me. This is a promise for God's people to grasp a hold of faith in Christ and to hold on, though the trial is difficult. God is in the business of saving people, even some who aren't fully ready and prepared. His desire is that all would come to repentance and faith, yet we know from prophecy that most will refuse. While the door of salvation is still open to the final sealing of God's people... Those in the end can still find Christ when they seek Him with all their heart and willingly choose to grasp by faith His promises. They take Christ at His word that forgiveness includes even them and they take hold of His hand by faith. This is the faith that saves. Do you want that kind of faith today? It was 16 days after the battle of Gettysburg that a father was called to the bedside of his wounded son. A young colonel in the, in the well, I don't know whether it's Northern or Southern Army, but in the American Army. After seeing his son, he went aside privately and asked the doctor, is there any hope for my son? And the doctor says, well, after the amputation, gangrene has set in. An artery could go at any time. At the most, your son has four days to live. So the father returns to the bedside of his son, and the son doesn't know his true condition. And the son says to the father, Father, did you talk to the doctor? What did he say? And with a breaking heart, the father tells his son what the doctor said, that the son has but at the most four days to live. At this, the son in fear and agony cries out, but I'm not prepared to die. I'm not ready. Please tell me, father, how can I get a hold of this? How can I be ready? Tell me in such a way I can understand it. I know you've told others this. Tell me too. There was silence. And the father asked the son, I see you are afraid to die. Yes, I am, said the son. Do you feel guilty? Asked the father. Yes, said the son, I have lived a wicked life. You you know how it is in the army. You want to be forgiven, asked the father. Yes, that is what I want, said the son. Can I? Can I still be forgiven? Certainly, said the father. Well, please tell me how before I die. Then the father said, do you remember the time when you were younger You came home from school, and I had to get after you because of something that you did. Do you remember how angry you became with me, and how you insulted me with terribly harsh language? Yes, said the son, I was remembering that the other day, and I felt so bad about that. Do you remember, said the father, how after your anger subsided, that you came to me and put your arms around me and says, Father, please forgive me. It was not your loving son that did that. I am so sorry. And do you remember what I said? I said, I forgive you with all my heart. Yes, said the son. I remember how good it felt to be forgiven. And I have loved you the more ever since. Well, said the father, it is the same way with Jesus. Tell him you are terribly sorry for your life of sin and the wickedness. And he will say to you, I forgive you with all my heart. Then believe that he does it. And it is so. Really, said the son, is it that simple? I can get a hold of that. I'll do it. And he did. Later we find the father breaking down and weeping uncontrollably at the bedside of his son as his son is facing death. 
But the son is lying there with joy on his face, and he says, Father, don't cry for me. I've made my peace with God. I'm happy again. And even if I die now, Father, I'm not afraid. Say, Father, I, I feel so good, so happy, so well, I think maybe I'll get well. In fact, I think I will get well. And from that moment on, his countenance began to improve. When the doctor came by, he says, My, Colonel, you're looking better today. And the young Colonel says, <clears throat> It says, my father told me how to be a Christian, and I got a hold of it. And I'm going to get well now, doctor. Say, doctor, you should be a Christian too. My father can tell you how to get a hold of it. The next morning, two other doctors came in, and they <clears throat> opened up the bandages to his amputated leg where the gangrene had been setting in, and they jumped back startled, saying, the gangrene has been arrested. The colonel will live. This is like, a, this, th your prayers are answered. And the colonel did live. He recovered completely and went home to his family and lived a life that is a life of honor and a witness to his Redeemer. Being prepared for the end of time comes through a transformation into the image of Jesus. It means having a living connection with him and hearing his voice. It means renouncing the world and all that is in it and <clears throat> seeking after Christ with all of the heart. For Christ wants to bring a complete change in our lives. The good news is it's still not too late. Today, Jesus is offering you that change of heart. All you must do is ask Him. Remember, faith is so simple. The Bible says in Proverbs 31, 24, Be strong and let your heart be courageous, all you who put your hope. In the Lord. Brothers and sisters, the Lord is coming very soon. He is giving his people messages of preparation. And he asks, prepare, 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 for I'm coming soon. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this message today. We thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit that is bringing home to your people's hearts the need to prepare for what is coming. We pray, Lord, that you will transform us as a people into the people you want us to be in these end times, that Christ might be reflected in our lives fully. In Jesus' name, amen.